I'd like to call the Health and Human Services Policy Committee back to order. Chair Moran had to step away, so as Vice Chair, I'll be presiding over the meeting. We've spoken with advocates from both sides, and we've decided to conclude testimony. Uh, and so we'll proceed with uh, questions from committee members. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a question for our author, uh, Representative Hunter Cantrell. Uh, I've, we heard a little bit tonight uh, today about uh, freedom of speech, and I was wondering if you had a chance to talk to people on the freedom of speech art, uh, issue that has been raised, and also about what are the limits for healthcare providers when it comes to the freedom of speech issue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Fisher. I have spoken with experts on the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, and we have concluded that this bill in no way inhibits the freedom of speech or the exercise of religion. Uh, there is well-documented legal phenomena, legal uh, uh, jurisprudence, uh, that one's freedom of speech and one's freedom of expression of religion ends at when it begins to harm another individual or individuals. So we have thoroughly explored that and we have found that this bill does not infringe on those essential liberties. And I have uh, with me today uh, Mr. Ben Feist from the ACLU. If there are any other questions related to the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion and how this bill in no way infringes on those essential liberties. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And also, as you're mentioning that uh, the freedom of expression in terms of religion, et cetera, but also when it gets into the medical field, uh, how does that apply for a uh, physician or a mental health practitioner? Uh, Are they limited as to what they're able to say when you're mentioning about when it does harm to another person? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Fisher. Uh, medical practitioners and mental health practitioners uh, are required to abide by um, the prescribed standards of care and overall by the principle of doing no harm. So when we consider that is the basis for sound ethical medical practice in our country, uh, we know that when anything, whether it is a, a, a therapeutic treatment, a talk therapy, uh, an idea or opinion from a practitioner, if that threatens the health, well-being, and overall um, uh, mental stability of a patient, we know that that is not ethical conduct from medical practitioners and mental health practitioners. So that is where we as a society have said, this is what we outline is acceptable practice for mental health and medical practitioners. Thank you. Other other questions from committee members? Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative uh, Cottrell, thank you so much for presenting this bill today. Um, I myself have been a therapist and I, I think that the ban on this that you're proposing um, is actually a reasonable one. And we heard a lot of testimony uh, here today because like you said, as, as clinicians, we take an oath to make sure that we're not doing harm. Um, I think from a lot of the testifiers that you brought here today, we can see that there is harm. Um, Conversion therapies honestly undermines the practice of therapy, it undermines, it undermines trust. Um, one of your uh, testifiers said it's mental health malpractice. I would agree with that. Um, the one thing actually, I would like to call up Ben Feist from the ACLU, if you wouldn't mind. Please identify yourself again for the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ben Feist. I'm the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feist. Can you speak, there was uh, some question about constitutionality. Um, could you speak to that a little bit uh, from your opinion as an ACLU attorney? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Edelson, uh, yes, I can speak to that at least um, 
in general. Mm -hmm. um, so we have looked at these types of bills throughout the country and generally speaking, um, when it is limited to um, licensed practitioners, these really don't raise free speech concerns. And this bill, I think, is very narrowly tailored to address the uh, unsafe and discriminatory practices of uh, conversion therapy. Thank you, Mr. Feist. I would also just note that, um, you know, I heard uh, with all the testifiers it opposed to this, and I do, um, their testimony was appreciated. Um, there was, there's a, not a place for legislators in this, is what I heard, that legislators are um, overstepping their territory. But one would also say that um, when we allow same-sex marriage, we overstepped our territory. When we deal with desegregation of schools, that we overstepped our territory. So looking at these things, um, members, is why the public put us here. Thank you, Mr. Feist. Any further comments or questions? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Cantrell. I appreciate this uh, conversation. Um, in a number of the testifiers' um, uh, uh, comments, they, they shared horrific stories. Um, no one should have to suffer at the hands of practitioners of those type of ordeals. I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, I did find it curious, and I'm looking for your comment. Uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Roby uh, from uh, Minnesota Mediation Services, who, <clears throat> given his certification as a, net, a neutrality neutral partner to this, um, made the comment that why wouldn't this uh, type of a situation where professional boards are already um, uh, observing uh, a non-practice of these types of things, why wouldn't it be more appropriately handled through the rulemaking authority of those boards? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Albright. Representative thank Cantrell. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, I think what is really critical about this bill is that we are codifying into law that this is a practice that is not tolerable. Rulemaking authorities are outside of the jurisdiction of the legislature, and we as legislators, I believe, are charged with rulemaking that is uh, something fundamental and foundational within our state. So to establish within law parameters around this practice, around this mental health malpractice, is a definitive statement that this is something we will no longer tolerate. And when that is an agreement with rulemaking authorities, that is fantastic. I think we as a legislature need to also affirm where the law stands on this. Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Thank you. Representative Cantrell, we authorize boards with rulemaking authority. Mm -hmm. And so it is under our purview. Uh, so to the extent that we would require boards to undergo rulemaking authority for that, we are interceding on, on behalf of the people that have been, has, have suffered at the hands of these uh, situations. In another testimony, particularly uh, from Mr. Avalos, uh, he shared with us just a, a very uh, uh, a tremendous testimony. But I noted that he uh, went to Texas for his uh, first uh, experience, understandably it was tragic, uh, then traveled to Philadelphia, came back to Minnesota. But I'm just wondering, in, in the context of the witnesses, I didn't hear specific names of any clinics in the state of Minnesota that are practicing this type of aberrant behavior. And I'm just wondering, if that is in fact happening, why isn't it being brought to the attention of the regulating board that they are a member of? Representative Cantrell. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Albright, it's difficult to quantify, and it is difficult 
sometimes, actually oftentimes, to know who exactly as clinicians, which clinics in particular, are providing conversion therapy services. Oftentimes, these services might be provided under a different specification, under a guise or a ruse, um, or oftentimes not widely advertised. What we do know is that this practice is still widespread in Minnesota, and what we want to do is to make sure that no more children are harmed. Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Cantrell, if in fact uh, that statement, and I have no reason to doubt you, is happening, why haven't there been uh, uh, police reports or legal action taken against those people on behalf of the people that have suffered at the hand of, hands of these clinicians? Representative Cantrell. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, because it is not yet illegal. Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Representative Cantrell, each one of the boards that was cited in the beginning of the testimony uh, says in their code of conduct that this activity is not legal. So I would take exception with the fact that it, it is it isn't illegal yet. And from the standpoint of if, if legality is a question, why hasn't there been any professional action taken with, in the context of those testifiers and those actions? Ha has there been action taken by the professional boards uh, for those uh, individuals who have practiced this? Representative Cantrell. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, I do not know about specific board proceedings pertaining to specific practitioners in this regard. Madam Chair. Representative I, Albright. Thank you for indulging me. One more. Um, we heard a lot about uh, the, uh, the concept, the statement made by some testifiers in terms of right to self-determination. Uh, also about uh, the right to follow the dictates of your own personal self-interests. And following that with uh, the observation by some uh, that this bill would discriminate against those who wish to have a self-determinant uh, directive. How would you respond to those uh, in the context of infringing upon the rights of those who would want to seek uh, affirming counsel from uh, professional clinicians of their choice as opposed to uh, restricting or prohibiting it outright. Representative Cantrell. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, one of the things that I noticed from the testimony of, of all the testifiers, I want to thank everybody who came up and talked, um, but the testifiers who had been through this therapy um, and who kind of talked about their therapeutic experiences, many of them talked about how they went. Uh, there was one, one individual, I believe her name was, was Luca, said that she went to a practitioner who provided a space um, for her to safely and, and uh, in, in an unbiased manner explore the questions of her gender identity. And, and what many of the testifiers talked about was going through therapies that were likewise unbiased, allowed for a space for an individual in a healthy way, in a constructive way, to explore their gender and sexuality uh, in, in, in a manner that um, would, would lead to self-navigation. But those therapies were self-directed. So actually, a lot of the therapies that were talked about would still be perfectly fine under this bill. If it's patient-directed, that's one thing. But if there is therapy with an agenda, if there is a practitioner who says, I have a therapy, at the end of which, you won't be gay anymore, or you won't be someone who's transgender anymore, that is something that would no longer be allowed. There's a distinction in that patient self-determination component. Because what we know is that sexuality, gender identity are not mental illnesses. And so a therapy that has an agenda, has the distinct goal of changing someone's sexuality rather than providing an experience through which someone can better understand their sexuality, 
Well, then that's one that's treating homosexuality and gender identity as a mental illness. And what we know from the experts who came up and testified for us, from the American Psychological Association and various others, is that that is no longer the standard of care. That is no longer the perspective through which bona fide therapies are conducted. So I would say that is the distinction that I would make in, in answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Representative Albright, we've got a growing list. Can we come back to you? Yes, put me on the list. Thank you. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is the um, testifier from the Psychological Association still around? Can I ask you a question? Please come to the testifier's table. Please state your name again. Uh, my name is Dr. Margaret Charmley. Thank you. Dr. Charmley, uh, in your professional opinion, what would be the difference between the therapy described by the first set of testifiers versus the second set of testifiers? One of the um, concerns I had with the second set of testifiers is that there may have been a misunderstanding about what our position is uh, from the American Psychological Association and the Minnesota Psychological Association. And by that I mean it's appropriate and good therapy within the context of people who are exploring their sexual orientation. If they have conflicts with their religious values, it's very important for a therapist to allow that person to openly explore their sexual orientation and their religious values and to honor both of those positions. Um, where we stand is that it is not acceptable to provide therapy with a distinct outcome in mind that changes sexual orientation. Uh, a number of people here testified that they had uh, therapists that allowed them to fully explore um, their religious conflicts and their sexual orientation. That's good therapy. That's not what we're uh, against. We're against someone that is promoting something with a specific outcome and not an outcome that allows the person to explore what that means for them. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. I'm going to follow up Dr. Mann. Um, I just wanted to make the point that this bill we're discussing today, we are talking about fake science. Uh, we have data going back decades that says that conversion therapy doesn't work. At best, it does nothing. And at worst, it causes significant trauma to those undergoing this procedure. Um, we, what we're trying to do is prevent more people from undergoing that trauma. And not only from the procedure itself, but from the false promise that this is a thing that is going to change who they are. Uh, and it's been said multiple times already today, uh, it, it doesn't prevent you from getting therapy if you need therapy. That is a whole different topic. Um, and lastly, we need to stop telling people in the LGBTQ communities that there is something wrong with them and that they need to be changed. Thank you, Dr. Tarmelly. Chair Liebling. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I originally was raising my hand to um, respond to the question about, or the comment about rulemaking. And, and I think um, Representative Albright correctly stated that um, we, delegate the <clears throat> we delegate the authority to make rules. But um, I think that it's really um, important in this case for us to draw a bright line here. And um, sometimes I have been reluctant to tell professional organizations who after all are the experts um, you know what their practice should be. But in this case, it's very clear that the vast majority of practitioners have decided that this is not a legitimate therapy, that it is harmful, and I think for us then to, um, to put it into law and make a very clear, bright line is in fact the appropriate thing to do. Not leaving it up to the boards through rulemaking, but giving it the force of law. I also wanna point out that, um, you know, you could, you could say, I, I think as Representative Albright saying, you know, why do we have to do this? I, I think there is a, some sense of 
perhaps it's a belt and suspenders kind of approach. You know, and there is some, that is something that we do all the time. You know, we can say very clearly in law that this is not appropriate, this is not a real therapy, this is not something we accept in our state, and we can say to the boards, we want to make sure that because this is such a well-recognized position, that you'll all treat it as something that's unprofessional conduct. I, I don't find that inappropriate at all. I think it's very appropriate. Another point I just wanted to make, too, is that the way the bill is written is really very, um, it, is, it is pretty um, modestly written, I would say, in that it, um, it really is aimed at children and, and vulnerable adults. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's important to point out, too. This is really about protecting people who may not be in a very good position to protect themselves. And I think that that is where the state really does have a responsibility to step in and make sure that people are protected until they are fully able to make their own decisions. Um, and, and finally, you know, it is important to note that um, as I read the bill, the um, up until this point, theoretically at least, um, our Medicaid program could be paying for this therapy. And this bill makes it very clear that this is not something that is covered, that we do not recognize this as something that the public should be paying for. Um, in fact, it should be something that is prohibited. So um, even after all of the testimony, some of which, and, and I, I do appreciate all of the testifiers, I think it was... Um, it is not easy to come to a public place like this. You're being recorded. You are in public and really open your soul to a bunch of strangers. And everybody who did that, we really do appreciate that, whichever side your opinion fell upon. But I, I feel really strongly that this is the right thing to do. This is not an overreach for the legislature. And in fact, it's something that we really must do to protect the children of our state. So thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Representative Cantrell. If, did you want to comment? I think that was just a, a statement by Chair Liebling. Representative Loeffler. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just thought um, I should, I wanted to reflect on the fact that this committee and the legislature for the 14 years that I've been here has historically always defined scope of practice in law. And sometimes we have very uh, difficult decisions to make where one group of providers versus another says, oh, we're trained better than they are. They shouldn't be able to do it. Um, and we routinely listen to the experts and listen to um, the best information we can have. And we weigh in on what is an appropriate scope of practice for anyone who receives a license from the state of Minnesota to practice in our healthcare system. And we have, I don't know, probably at least it feels like 50 or more of those that we've seen at various points. And to me, this, this is our obligation to say to the public, we are looking out for you to tell the education programs, this is what we want our practitioners ready to do and what we don't think they should do based on the research and our consideration of the information that we've gotten. And I think that the role of the licensing boards is much more narrow. If you look at the statute that's referenced here, it talks about how they have to verify that you've had 2,000 hours of supervised um, oversight before you get your full license. You, that you've gotten your, your training with 45 hours in this and 60 hours in that. And yes, they do respond to complaints. They do respond to, to issues about whether someone is competent. It may be someone who's developing early Alzheimer's and it, their patients start to understand that they're not, that someone ought to overview whether or not they can continue to practice in their field. But we've never left it to the licensing boards to decide the basic core services that we think should be available to everyone who has that license. And so I think that, that that's important. The other thing I think we need to do is we're public policy developers. I think public policy should be developed by the people that the people elect to wrestle with difficult issues, to listen to testimony on both sides of an issue, to weigh the issues, and not to assume that it should be based on individuals filing complaints, filing lawsuits. We heard on from both sides how difficult, how emotional this is for the people who went through it, whether they felt like it was a good experience in their life or a bad experience in their life. They all started it 
with nervousness in their voice. It takes a lot. They all went through a very difficult time, which is why they sought therapy or were recommended to have therapy because they were clearly experiencing some dissonance and they wanted some assistance and guidance in dealing with that. And I hope that this is just another big step forward on a process that we have started long ago to help people with self-acceptance and acceptance by society that we are a big range of people. We are no longer just straight or gay or heterosexual or homosexual. We have bisexual people, some of whom will acknowledge that they're attracted to both, some of whom are trying to figure out if they're more attracted to one or another. We also have people who aren't, don't have much of a sex drive and are trying to figure out what, what that means for them in their life. We have people who, who wrestle with gender. And as we learn more and more about genetics, we understand that it's much more complicated than we ever thought before. And I hope that we as a, a committee and as a legislature can continue to step on that path that says, we want everyone to feel like they can be who they inherently are, who they believe if they have a faith that they're, they're, they're God created to be who they are and that who feel accepted in exploring the paths ahead of them and choose the one that has most meaning and most satisfaction and that will most enable them to give their gifts to, to the world. And that's my goal and I think this is a step towards that. And so I wanna thank you, Representative Cantrell for bringing this forward. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I guess I, I had a really practical question to ask, but um, Representative uh, Lothler, the comment you just made exclude, excluded one group, which is a group of people who um, have also a different viewpoint that possibly they're struggling with their sexuality, but their faith is strong in their personal religion, whatever that might be and they are looking for a different option, and you're saying that that voice cannot be allowed and it's against the law at, at this point. Um, and that's what, that's what this bill does. But I honestly, that wasn't, I mean, you let us down that path is the only reason I brought that up, and, and you can respond to that, but I really wanted to ask a far more practical question, which is, is just, um, as patients are, you know, going through this, would, would they be, how would they seek relief? Would they have to release their, um, their, the notes from their sessions or how would, how would one actually, in a practical application, how would they get relief on uh, filing this complaint or, or getting the consequence of, of, of registering a, a complaint about this occurring? Representative Cantrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pearson. Uh, so depending on the scope of the complaint, um, it could either, if it's going to law enforcement or if it's going to the licensing board, um, that would be up to the respective practices on a case-by-case -case basis of, of what the, the client has said. This, here is my complaint. Here is my concern. This practitioner was doing X. So that really is, I think, a case-by-case -case kind of idea. And they might request notes from the meeting. They might request any amount of evidence that they would see necessary to thoroughly investigate whether or not uh, a practitioner was engaging in this practice um, should this bill become law. Representative Pearson. And so then what would the outcomes of that be? Again, I, I'm just in a practical application, and if, if you want to ask somebody, you know, I'm, I'm assuming there are complaints in psychiatry in these areas outside of this that happen. I just, I'm just really, do they lose their license? What, what are the consequences? Representative Cantrell. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Pearson. So in the bill, um, let's see if we can find it. Um, so on the back, uh, lines 2.1 to 2.3, uh, mental health practitioner or mental health professional may be subject to disciplinary action by the licensing board of the mental health practitioner or the mental health professional. So it would be at the discretion of the board at what they choose to do, um, but we're, we're delegating that authority in terms of pursuing proper relief um, to that board. Representative Pearson. Yeah, I guess that's really what I'm looking for is like, what are the specifics? What are the outcomes of this type of violation? And, and I. I don't just mean 
here, again, I, I'm a real estate agent. Explain this to me like I don't know what goes on for folks in that profession when they're then put in front of their board for discipline. T give me a practical example of, of what's going to happen to folks when these complaints are registered and filed. Representative Cantrell, and if there is any, if there are testifiers in the audience who can speak to this, please come to the testifiers table. Please state your name again. <laughs> Dr. Margaret Charmley. I'm without my uh, gold leaf jacket. I forgot it at home when I went to eat. So sorry, you may not recognize me from today. I'm sorry. Would you please state uh, the, the question sure. again? Representative you know, Pearson. Yeah, I'm, and I'm so sorry. I don't mean to draw this out. I, just on a practical level, when, when someone's brought in front of the discipline board then of, of you know, having violated not just this but any Anything on what level or what type of discipline would would someone who practice a practitioner face? Um, first, I was asking, you know, is the person who's a, a victim of this are there are there um, you know their patient client or doctor patient confidentiality agreement? Is that going to be is that going to be have to be opened up for these complaints to be registered? Um, which of course is very sensitive to those people and individuals, the patients. Um, and then additionally, then what type of discipline would be common for a violation of, of this sort or just generally what types of disciplines are the boards empowered with? Dr. Charmley. Thank you. Um, the answer to that is it depends. So if this were to become a law, then um, if a person violated the law and filed a complaint with the Board of Psychology um, and they were a client, their records would be open to the Board of Psychology in order to investigate the claim. So if I were, as a psychologist, were to have a complaint filed against me for how I practice psychology, um, I would have to re release those records. So the client um, forecloses on their option of confidentiality if they bring a complaint before the Board because the Board may, needs to fully assess what happened in those sessions. And they do that by looking at the notes of what happened. Did that answer your question, sir? Representative Pearson. It, it covers question one very well, but it, okay. it opens up a section B then, which would be, could the person withdraw their complaint then at some point if they didn't want that exposure? Dr. Charmley. Well, once a complaint is filed, I think it goes to the board. So I don't know, I don't know if people have actually withdrawn their complaints because once the psychologist is called upon to release records, they, they have to go. Now in terms of what kind of disciplinary action might happen, um, it, it depends on how egregious whatever somebody did was. So, um, you know, sometimes the board will say, we'll have an educational session, you know, we want you to be aware that you have done this and we want you to have some additional training or to be under supervision. And sometimes in the case of more egregious um, uh, disciplinary actions, people may have their license revoked. Representative Backer. Yeah, Chair, <clears throat> thank you. We know a number of us, all of us got several um, emails and calls on this, so, and we had good testifiers. A um, couple questions that came to me, and if you could ask this here. What, under this law, what would happen if you had a religious ministry who um, wanted to advertise, um, uh, hold a conference and advertise maintaining sexual purity. And in that conference, they encourage people who attended to avoid sexual activity outside of marriage, normal or homosexual or, or bisexual or, or anything. So what would happen under that? What, different people have different interpretations on that. I mean, could you answer that, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Backer. Um, so this bill doesn't at all prohibit people from selling tickets to conferences, selling a book about their experience going through conversion therapy. It, it doesn't prohibit any of that. It doesn't prohibit, um, like you said in your example, um, a religious ministry selling tickets to a purity conference in which they they say, you know, abstain from sex before marriage or, or completely whatever the purpose of the conference is. None of that, none of that is covered at all in this bill. This bill is rather narrow in scope and says, 
if you, as a mental health practitioner, as, uh, as an individual, are selling a service, portraying a service as being able to change someone's sexuality from whatever to, to heterosexual, that's what this is prohibiting. So they can, they can absolutely still have their, their purity conference uh, it, should this bill become law. Okay, follow, follow up, Chair. Representative Backer. Thank you for, nice to see you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, um, explain to me the practical sense of, of um, you know, we heard a lot of testifiers for and against, and, and, and they were moving, and I, I appreciate that. But let's, let's look at the practical sense. So someone comes into a, a therapist and, and, and are having the, the challenges. What would that therapist not be able to th say? Or what could they say? Or what would they not be able to say under, under this? And, and, you know, if there's a testifier that wants to help out, I'm okay with that. I'm just, I've been getting these questions, hundreds of emails. So what would they be able to say? And what would they not be able to say, please? May I? I'm Dr. Margaret Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Minnesota here. Um, my understanding is that what a therapist would not be allowed to say is that same-sex feelings and romantic attractions are pathological or a mental illness. That would be outside the scope of appropriate therapy. Within the context of appropriate therapy, it would be perfectly acceptable for a therapist to help an individual explore their religious values. And in some cases, some people resolve a conflict between their sexual orientation if they have same-sex feelings and their religious identity by being abstinent. Some people choose that route and they're perfectly acceptable with that. So that would uh, be fine to explore that. Representative Backer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for that. You know, one of the concerns that I've seen from several emails, even myself, is, is maybe we could, you could tighten this up down the road, but the language is vague. Um, I'm an EMT, I'm not a doctor, but from my practical experience, when a patient gets in the back of the ambulance, they do not give me direction. They're looking for direction. And that's a concern that I have we have not had a tradition, and I would ask the author to look at this. We have a tradition, if I go to any therapist or doctor and ask for help, and they can, this I see could limit them saying, hey, this is a choice. Because as we know, young people don't have the same experiences as we do around this table. They have not lived as long as I have, um, or, or, and so forth. So that's what really concerns me about that, that we're limiting that speech. We heard that, I think it was Jeremiah, um, or Jeremy, excuse me, um, if I remember correctly, um, th a father of three, was able to get that, that help. And for him, that was good. We also heard from from Junior that the help he got was horrible and, and, and that was bad, you know, and so forth. But my concern is when someone comes to a patient, they are looking for help. The doctor or the therapist says, hey, here are the options. And um, I'm concerned that this would be limited as not one of their options for that patient to make the decision like um, Jeremy made that decision and so forth. So that, that would be a concern and would ask you to look into that. And, and that's a huge concern of mine. Thank you. That's, that's all I have, Chair. Thank you so much. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, I first want to be able to, I've got basically a statement. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Representative uh, Hunter Cantrell, for bringing this forward. Um, this is based on a bill that I first started four years ago, and I, I want to tell a little mm -hmm. bit about where I came from on it and, and what we had gone through. Um, is uh, working at a homeless youth shelter, we deal with a lot of youth ages 16 to 21, and probably one of the biggest frustrations that I've had over the years that I've been there is that sometimes the youth that we come that have come to us don't make it. And when I say they don't make it, they end up dead. Um, sometimes it's around these issues. I, I remember one gentleman who had been uh, with us. Uh, he had been, he had just turned 18. Uh, several times before that, uh, while he was under 18, he had uh, left home. Uh, because he was being a subject to trying to cure him of being gay and going through different processes. Um, uh, he was not able to escape that until he finally turned 18 and ended up with us. 
Um, at that point, he was in a major state of depression and quite suicidal. Um, we were not able to help him. Uh, and he had to move on to an uh, intensive uh, therapy situation, and it, it was not a good situation. Um, it's also not the first time that I've seen this over time, where we have youth who are homeless because their families have kicked them out and they're, because of where they may be with their uh, gender orientation or sexual orientation. And there have been several times where they're, they're under 18, they are with us, they clearly need mental health and want to ha have some appropriate mental health uh, treatment. But their parents at that point then decide to intervene because they are under 18, they can demand that the children be returned to them. And in those instances, they wanted them returned to go through their mental health therapy versus something that would have been more encompassing. These were some things that started raising me to take a look at the situation. And one of the things as I was doing research is that I found out over time is that in situations over the years, it has not been unusual when people are trying to be converted in a forced way. And remember now, we're just talking about people who are under 18 or vulnerable adults. Anyone who is of age is able to do what they would like and seek out the professional help they would like. But when you're under 18, you're trapped by your parents. You don't have that free choice to be able to get the help. And this is where the abuse starts coming in. And in many other areas, we allow abuse to be addressed. But when we're dealing with our youth in this type of situation, um, it becomes a whole different process. We have to make sure that we're setting up the protections there. Uh, when youth are being uh, subjected or, um, and in some cases I would see it as abuse, they really don't have any ramifications. They don't have the protection that we're talking about. Um, and in some of the areas where uh, you might say, well, what about a report to child protection? Well, the person's turned 18, you know, by then, what can they do? And they are in such a, a state of dealing with the mental uh, issues that they're surrounding, uh, the, uh, the self-actualization. They don't see themselves as a person. They feel that they're, they, they aren't equal to everybody else. Uh, and seeing people trying to wrestle with the damage that has been done is part of the reason that I went into this. And it's not only the, the individuals themselves, but some of the research that I had looked into also showed the damage it had caused to some of the families. In some of the instances, it ended up where families were broke apart, divorce occurred. Suicide also happened to some of the other adult family members because they realized the damage that had occurred there. So it's not just the individual, but the long-term impact, impact that then ends up happening to other family members. So it's not just the damage that might occur locally, but the damage that spins out from there. And that's why I'm very happy that you're putting this out there to address the situation. And I very strongly support it and encourage a yes vote on the bill. Thank you. Representative New. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and Representative Cantrell. Um, <coughs> boy, this is a tough committee. <laughs> um, so thank you to everyone who has testified. Um, this has heart been heart-wrenching from every side. So I really appreciate all of you who have spoken today. I know it's incredibly difficult. And this is certainly an issue that's very close to me, so I appreciate that. Um, and I'll be honest, this is very close to me on both sides of this, which makes it especially difficult for me today. Um, certainly, I have people in my life who I would be horrified if they were treated as these young men were treated. And they've been, been able to make it to adulthood in beautiful and healthy ways, are in wonderful, long-term, healthy relationships and marriages. And I honor that and I appreciate that. I also have people who are very close to me who have made the choices that some of the folks behind me have, have made. Um, and they also are living wonderful, successful, fulfilling lives with the choice that they have made. And so I have concerns about um, codifying the elimination of those choices for those who want it. Um, and I, like I said, we've heard compelling testimony on both sides. Um, so my questions really are very specific to the language because I think the language is really important. And in fact, um, if we can, I know that we did have an attorney, um, Ms. Carlson, is Ms. Carlson still here? If I could ask just a couple of questions. We've, um, 
Mrs. Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, We've had a lot of discussions uh, and we've been hearing a lot of questions about patient directed um, therapies and that that would still be allowable under this language. Um, as I read it, I have concerns actually that it would not be allowable. So I guess my question would be in line 1.10, there's language that says uh, that seeks to change at the end of that line. Um, and, and I guess my question would be, is there a point at which that language becomes valid? And I guess what I mean by that is if someone goes in and a therapist says, we're going to change this, I think that would obviously fall under this language. If someone comes in and says, I want to change and then a therapist <laughs> seeks to change um, in it being directed by the patient, would that therapist now be liable under this language? Ms. Carson. Madam Chair, Representative, um, this, our concern is that this bill is entirely overbroad and vague. Specifically to that point, we do know that professional speech is protected speech, so that speech between the, um, the practitioner and the client is protected under the First Amendment. This bill obliterates that protection and undeniably infringes upon the rights of many Minnesotans in violation of their First Amendment constitutional rights. Under this bill, they would not be able to have the latitude that you explain. Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, Representative Cantrell, you had mentioned, you know, Representative Back Backer gave this scenario of maybe a conference or something that would um, encourage abstinence or something along those lines. I also have concerns in line 1.11, um, you know, that specifically says it includes efforts to change behaviors, um, and, and it goes on and talks about uh, what that may mean, but could change behaviors, and again, I guess this would be for Ms. Carlson in trying to get a handle on the language. When we say change behaviors, could that actually include a conference encouraging abstinence? And I mean, I, I understand obviously Representative Cantrell would, would say that th this is a more narrow scope, but the way I read it, is pretty broad and that's concerning to me. Ms. Carson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, I actually, with respect to that question, would draw your attention to um, subdivision seven. Um, the entire section, again, is, is overbroad, and I believe that you're speaking to an example that we gave in our analysis. And under that analysis, the concern is that this language prohibits uh, people from certain behaviors, but it doesn't give guidelines as to what those prohibitions are. So. Um, under that language, we don't know. And that example seems to go along with um, the way it's described here because it says reasonably interpreted or inferred. That's very broad language. It's vague language and it's firmly unconstitutional, depriving Minnesotans of their rights under the United States Constitution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is hands down my hardest vote <laughs> um, in my short time in the legislature. Um, but again, I, I appreciate the folks who have testified. I would, I would echo uh, Representative Liebling's comments that we want to protect children. And, you know, Ms. McBride visited with me in my office, and I appreciate that. Um, and, and, I, and I expressed to her at the time that if I felt like the scope of this bill was limited to, to this prohibition, um, and particularly with the coercive therapies that, that these young men experienced, um, I would be 100% on board. I absolutely would be. Um, I, I, I'm a little concerned that, that we would be dismissive of the folks behind us and their experiences as well. Um, and, and I think we need to, to honor that. Um, I would love to see some, some narrowing of the scope and the language. Um, so that we really can get a handle on these practices that are, I mean, there are no words for how despicable 
some of the, some of these uh, tactics have have been. There are no words for that, um, and I'm certainly a hundred percent on board for getting a handle on that. But I, I have real concerns that the scope of this bill is is much broader than than what we would intend. And I would hope that we would also honor the experiences of the folks who who would seek these kinds of therapies. Thank you. Okay, Representative Cantrell, would you like to respond to any of that? Or? Uh, I appreciate, or thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate Representative News feedback. Okay. Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Cantrell, and, and also Representative Fisher, because you really have been leading the way on this for several years now. Um, and it, I guess it strikes me, especially listening to Representative New and, and then the uh, really the amazing testifiers, both for and against this bill, that um, this does bring up really powerful um, emotions and powerful issues, right? These go, but these, it's pretty core to so many of us, um, sexual orientation, gender identity, faith. Um, why are we even here in the world to, 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 to a great extent? Um, and I think it's so critical in this, regardless of your position, but I guess I'm especially, as somebody who is, you know, I'm in favor of, 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 of this proposal, but especially speaking to those who, who spoke against and have, have been um, concerned by it, um, to make sure that we really are tied to the language of the bill and to specifically what it does. Because I was concerned in listening to some of the comments that, that, um, that were, we may not be so focused on that. And to focus that, and to recognize that, that those who are struggling the most with some of those issues are the people who are protected by this, those under 18, uh, vulnerable adults, which is a term which has a pretty narrow meaning. There's a reference in the testimony to that, but, but if you look in the statute, it's, it's quite narrow. Um, and to recognize that there is a, uh, there is a problem uh, uh, and a particular concern with, uh, with an approach that is seeking in advance as a preordained goal of doing something with respect to that person's sexual orientation or gender identity that says in advance we are seeking to change that. Um, uh, Representative Backer made the comment about um, uh, that folks really, patients do come in and are seeking guidance and that, and that is definitely true. Um, and I heard so many folks speaking in opposition to this saying, Patients ultimately, individuals need to be in charge of their own treatment. They have to have, to have the chance to set their own goals. And to my mind, that's exactly what this bill is doing. This is saying that um, support and understanding, uh, as we heard from, uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Charmely, um, uh, working with a patient um, to get to where that patient is at the best spot for that patient with that patient's faith and that patient's uh, background, everything with that patient, that's what this is about. But deciding in advance where the therapist comes in and says, this is my goal, is to change this person's orientation, that's the thing that is the concern. That's the thing where the therapist has decided, that's taking it out of, out of the patient's uh, hands at that point. Um, so in my view, and I, I respect, um, I understand Representative New's concerns about the, the scope of this, but in my view, it really is written in a narrow way to say that when the goal is to change the behavior, when that's the preordained goal, that is prohibited. But stepping back from that, of course, having patients be able to work through uh, issues with the support of a counselor of the type that we actually heard, and oddly enough, surprisingly enough, we heard so much about that from those opposed to the, to the bill when they talked about their own experience as the counselors. Um, that's powerful. And that, in my view, would be um, permitted under this and should continue to be permitted, and, and I would believe that, uh, that it certainly would be. Um, so I think it's important that we listen to um, physicians, to psychiatrists, to those um, who, who, um, who are telling us what the standard of care is and what their expertise is. Um, I will say, having looked through a number of these concerns expressed about the legal implications, um, uh, I, I just, I, I don't see, it seems to me that, uh, that um, many of these are quite a stretch, in my view. Um, if the goal is to seek to change the individual orientation, it's a practice by a mental health practitioner, et cetera, et cetera, that is barred. Um, many of the other situations, in my view, are not. Um, and this is necessary protection uh, for those who are greatly vulnerable, um, and particularly vulnerable, as described by Representative Fisher in his work um, with, with homeless youth and with others. So thank you so much for bringing this forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Cantrell and all of the witnesses who have been with us today. Um, we have greatly benefited from all of your testimony, so thank you. 
I also have concerns about the scope, and so I have two questions regarding that. Um, the first question, um, we, you know, in, in especially section uh, one and two, it talks about mental health practitioners or mental health professionals. And it seems like from some of the testimony that they were receiving counseling from people who may not have fit that category, people who are clergy or uh, lay persons who provide prayer, uh, other ways of um, counseling people. So I just wondered, how, how does this bill affect people who are not meeting the definition of mental health professional? Either one of you. <laughs> Okay, who would like to take that? Well, Representative Cantrell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Robbins, for, for your question here. Um, to, to assist in answering your question, uh, I'm going to recall uh, Ms. McBride uh, to the testifier's table, please. Uh, Madam Chair, I, don't, I apologize for interrupting. But may I respond to that as well, following? Yes, uh, Ms. McBride, please. Can you restate your name again? Yep, Emma McBride. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Representative Robbins, um, this bill I think is really simple, especially the second part, which actually uplifts our current consumer protection laws that say that you cannot sell a service for money that is promising to do something that it cannot. So what the second part of this legislation seeks to do is uplift that. Um, it says that you cannot sell conversion therapy for money if you promise to change someone's gender identity, expression, or someone's sexual orientation. We've heard from many doctors and experts here today that um, that is not a promise that you can make, that conversion therapy is not effective. So that's what this bill seeks to do. Thank you. Robin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would the other lawyer wish to come back and respond? I don't know where she went. Carson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Representative. Um, the language in the spill, if you look at specifically uh, line 212, says any person or entity. Again, that is an example of the broad and sweeping language of this bill, and it doesn't read as something that is narrow. <coughs> Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, Representative Cantrell and, and the other testifier. My, that was related to my second question about scope, because I do think in the first... Um, two sections that specifically says mental health practitioner and mental health professional, both in the definition and the prohibition, but in subdivision seven, it, it strays from that and it says no person or entity. Um, so it seemed to leave the, the, the narrowness of mental health professional. So I just wondered, Representative Kentrell, if you could address that. Thank you. Representative uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Robbins. So this bill, is uh, twofold in its impact. So it prohibits uh, mental health practitioners, uh, mental, let me just make sure you have mental health professionals um, from engaging in conversion therapy, but it also contains a component of uh, adding on to our uh, consumer protection statutes, that's 325F.69, um, that says, look, we're not, you're not going to be able to sell a fraudulent good with a fraudulent promise in the state of Minnesota. That's something that is quite honestly, I think, a standard that we all can get behind, especially when that good leads to long-term detriment to an individual's health and well-being. So that's why we included that component, Representative Robbins. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Representative Robbins? Nothing further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Pinto kind of made my point, actually, thank you. Um, just that I think that the premeditation of this um, really separates it. And I can speak personally from having had several patients who have gone through conversion therapy. I think we've kind of gotten away from how punitive this is. It often involves extreme shaming 
sometimes physical abuse, sometimes sexual abuse. This is, this is a horrifying practice, and I, I just wanted to add that. So thank you for bringing this forward, Representative Cantrell. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees uh, around this table with the intent that Representative Cantrell has brought forward. Um, our, our core, at our core, we spoke about that. It is about safety for the public, uh, first and foremost. Um, I think Representative Pinto said it very, very well. Um, when you are soliciting under false pretense, when you are soliciting or misrepresenting what your service or good could provide, or with the knowledge of a predetermined outcome based upon a request. But to some extent, those objections have already been addressed by consumer protection laws that are already on the books. If you take a look at, and, and this may be uh, an op-ed, and then I'll have both the attorney for the ACLU as well as for the attorney that's on the, at the table already, and maybe I'll pose it in a question and see how both of you respond to it. Um, the Supreme Court uh, issued, uh, so has issued several rulings, and I'm happy to provide this uh, document to everyone else so that uh, you can take a look at it. Um, but they make a statement uh, with regard to a ruling on um, the marijuana, but it, it has bearing on this. It says, as with other kinds of speech, regulating the content of professional speech poses the inherent risk that the government seeks not to advance a legitimate regulatory goal, but to suppress unpopular <coughs> ideas or information. Furthermore, it says, when the government polices the content of professional speech, it can fail to preserve an uninhibited marketplace of ideas in which the truth will ultimately prevail. And in a final uh, conversation um, comment, it says, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And the people lose when the government is, on, is the one deciding which ideas should prevail. So in the context of uh, the recent Supreme Court precedent that talks about Second Amendment, uh, excuse me, uh, these amendment, these uh, rulings, I understand you are an attorney, and Mr. is it Mr. Feist? If you could, if, if he would come down, thank so you. So why don't we have uh, Ms. Carson respond first, and then Mr. Feist. Okay. Uh, have you, have let me, let me, ask, let me pose the question okay. because I think it's, it's helpful. We, we're, we're deliberating about, and I, I had a sidebar with um, a couple of people, there seems to be a divergence of understanding with regard to the, the kind of the preamble in subdivision one and how it uh, connects with subdivision seven, which really goes to the point of what uh, Representative New and others have expressed as well. So with regard to rulings such as McCollin versus Coakley, and I, I know that these are just being thrown out, but Abrams versus the United States, aren't we suppressing the, 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 the speech of professionals by interceding in the patient-provider relationship with this type of language? Ms. Carson. Madam Chair, um, actually the, the Supreme Court has spoken to that exact point recently on this very idea of um, the so-called conversion therapy ban bills in the recent Nifla v. Becerra case of, of 2018 where they actually said that professional speech is not entitled to any less protections under the First Amendment than any other speech. And so the way this bill is drafted doesn't read to me like something that's drafted to regulate conduct, but rather a direct attack on speech based on content and viewpoint to silence people who have 
a different opinion than the authors of this bill. And the Supreme Court's rulings and holdings um, support that contention. The Supreme Court, in fact, in NIFA also made mention of two other courts stating that their, um, their description of a very similar bill, but actually narrower, was in fact erroneous when those courts held that the bills were constitutional um, because they were simply a regulation of conduct. In addition to that, we also know that the Supreme Court has said that professional speech, again, doesn't deserve any less protection under the First Amendment. And I'll just draw your attention to one more thing, a case um, just coming out of Florida, the district court there also um, um, uh, granted an injunction for a bill uh, that was for actually a law that was passed similar to this, but again, a lot narrower. It didn't involve vulnerable, vulnerable adults, which is a caveat. The statute here um, in Minnesota with vulnerable, vulnerable adults includes those adults who simply have physical infirmities, meaning that it also includes people who are, who are entirely co competent, but just need assistance for their physical um, capacity. So again, um, Going back to the Florida case, the district court held that um, the plaintiffs in that case, challenging a very similar but narrower law, which only applied to minors, did in fact establish um, a likelihood of success on the merits based on their First Amendment claims. So I would urge the members here to consider that these bills are quite new. They're just coming out. The courts are beginning to weigh in on them, and they're beginning to say these are a flagrant violation of our First Amendment rights. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Carson. Uh, Mr. Feist, would you like to respond to the question? Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, Ben Feist, the ACLU of Minnesota. Uh, thanks for the question. It's a good one, um, Representative. And um, what I can say, first off, the ACLU takes free speech really seriously. I think everybody should know we often get in trouble because we are defending the free speech rights of uh, folks who may not share other views with our organization on other issues um, or um, in any other number of things. So we, we take free speech incredibly seriously. And when looking at a case uh, like this, it's clear that although constitutionally protected, uh, physicians' professional communication may be reasonably restricted under a series of case law that's out there. I can't speak directly to um, the cases that you're citing and give a legal opinion of that right now, but there is a test that you go through uh, when looking at this, and one of the main things that you're going to look at is you know, what are the norms in the medical community? Um, if this is outside of regular practice, um, it may be a lot easier to find this to be a reasonable restriction. And again, I can't say exactly how the courts would approach this, but I, I do want to distinguish, um, I understand generally that the Florida case um, was a different bill uh, than this one, same um, idea here, but uh, went at it in a different way. And so I think that is um, distinguishable and I should note as well that um, yeah, in Illinois, this issue has also come up with something a little bit more on point. And to my knowledge, this has been upheld um, currently under law. So certainly not settled. These are issues that can be debated and will be debated. Um, but at this point, um, again, from the ACLU perspective, uh, this bill looks to be on pretty solid ground. Representative Albright. Madam Chair, I, I won't have any more questions, but I think you know the, the comments made by both sides on this issue, um, I, I think I, 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 I come down to share uh, the concerns that it is unsettled. This is, the practice is wholly horrific, terribly unsettling, and I, will, I would defend a, a person's uh, opportunity to, to uh, find those that have uh, done them wrong, you know, find them out. And, and that's, I think, the purpose of Representative Cantrell's uh, legislation. Um, but the breadth, Representative Cant Cantrell, I think you've heard from other people, is it's not nebulous. It is, it is with question uh, that, that still poses some concerns, uh, as expressed by others and myself. Um, I, I think as the 
bill follows its track, I would hope that you would uh, be open to suggestions about how to tighten up some of the language, some of the definitional um, connections, the sinews that put this together. Um, I, I do appreciate your uh, tenacity and your perseverance. Um, we always, in the policy, um, we never try to suggest that we're impugning the integrity of the author. But we are fierce about making sure that the policy is right. So I appreciate your willingness to weather the storm, if you will. Thank you. And to that, Representative Albright, you know, I just want to remind the members that this bill will be traveling to Commerce, where we can have deeper discussion around those issues and factors. Um, Representative Pinto? I guess, uh, Madam Chair, I'll just say this really briefly. I just wanted to just note in that subdivision 7 that we've been talking about that it simply restricts, if you look on lines 2.12 to 2.14, there has to be fraud, false pretense, false promise, false guarantee, misrepresentation, false or misleading statements, deceptive practice. Everything else in that subdivision is qualified by those phrases. You can't use those sorts of concepts. You can't be fraudulent. You can't speak falsely, et cetera, when advertising. Um, product services, et cetera. This is directed at conversion therapies services in particular. Um, and so I guess that's where I would certainly agree with Mr. Feist. I, I know from all kinds of experience about how fierce the ACLU is in protecting free speech. Um, if they say this is on solid ground, this is on solid ground. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mann. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I find it kind of rich that when it comes to a bill like this, we start talking about protecting professional speech and the patient-doctor relationship when it comes to other things like women's health, for example, we are trying to prevent physicians from telling uh, their patients all their facts. But I'm sure we will talk about that another day. Um, what I was going to say is that I think we're spiraling a little bit. Uh, I feel like the bill is pretty straightforward. It's just saying that we cannot offer a service that is a hoax. And we need to protect people from that. In fact, you know, just to bring that point home, we have a, a physician's database that we can go into and type anything we want, how to treat depression, how to set a broken bone, whatever. And when I type in conversion therapy, nothing comes up, nothing. I get uh, management of potentially resectable colorectal cancer liver metastasis. Uh, the treatment of mycobacterium avium complex lung infections, it doesn't exist because it's not a real medical thing. And that's all we're saying is that we shouldn't be able to provide things that aren't real to people. Thank you, um, Representative Mann. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's nice having some doctors on this committee, and it's kind of hard <laughs> to follow them. <laughs> I don't think I can top anything that uses the word colorectal. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I was more, uh, I'm more used to like the line of reasoning that Representative Pinto was kind of following and I was kind of going to go along those lines, but that might be because you, in addition to having a couple of doctors on this committee, you have a couple of lawyers on this committee. Um, so he mentioned just, this is, you know, that this is a narrow bill. He mentioned that it requires, you know, if you look at line 2.13, it requires a false promise, a false guarantee, as Representative slash Dr. Mann said, a hoax, basically. Uh, and it's limited even further than that. If you go down to line 2.15, it's got to be, for it to violate this section, it's, it has to be something that reasonably could be interpreted or inferred as representing homosexuality as a mental disease, disorder, or illness, or guaranteeing, you know, not just saying maybe we can, but it, it, you know, to violate this, it has to, guarantee, it has to be a statement that guarantees a change in an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. And we know, we've heard from psychologists, we've heard from doctors, we've heard from therapists, we've heard from NAMI, that that's not something you can do, and when you try to do it, it's extremely harmful. You know, it was mentioned that uh, because at the beginning of line 2.12, it uses the words person or entity, that somehow that makes this overbroad, um, because it applies to any person or entity. But this is, you know, I'm not used to, this isn't the Commerce Committee, I'm not used to looking at the Commerce Statutes, but this is in the Commerce section of law, uh, section 325F.69, unlawful practices. 
Um, you know, this is this would add a new subdivision seven. If you look to subdivision six, it's deceptive use of a financial institution name. First word, first thing it says there is no person shall include the name, trade name, or logo. Section before that, section five, prohibited going out of business sales. It is illegal for any person to represent falsely that a sale is a going out of business sale. This is entirely consistent with those other sections of the consumer protection statutes. It uses the same language. It's not overbroad. It's actually a very narrow bill that targets a very narrow and very harmful practice. Um, I applaud you, Representative Cantrell, for bringing this forward. If I'm not mistaken, you're 23 years old. Um, when I was 23 years old, I was not sitting in front of legislative committees speaking about really harmful practices like this. Um, I really admire your courage in taking this on. I think, you've, I think this is a great bill, and I think we all need to support this. Representative Pearson. Thank you. Just again, kind of practical definitional question that um, has been kind of haunting me ever since I didn't get asked if I had a follow-up question earlier. And I was going to let it go, but I can't. Um, can you, uh, Representative Cantrell, the term gender expressions isn't, isn't defined in law that I'm aware of. What's the, in, what's the intent of that term? Representative Cantrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Pearson, um, can you point, can you just, oh, sure. here I found it. I found 1.12. 1. 1. 1. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. So that seeks to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, including efforts to change behaviors or gender expressions. You know, I think if, Madam Chair and Representative Pearson, I think if, if we are considering this, this statute in the context of, of the, the medical practice and the medical services, mental health services uh, being offered by professionals, I think that it can be reasonably interpreted that, um, that there are qualities of gender expression that, that, as one of my testifiers was talking about earlier, um, and this is, this is just one example, uh, that may be viewed as coming from somebody who identifies as a man, as being effeminate. And so when, when we are looking at the, at the context of this statute, and we are looking at the practice that this statute seeks to prohibit, uh, it, it is harmful, and that's what the statute is outlining, it is harmful to, to make somebody behave in a, in a way that that at least if you're promising a therapy that might make somebody not gay anymore, uh, that might make them act more masculine, that might change the way that, that they express their gender identity with an intended goal. Um, and uh, it is actually in the Safe Schools Bill in Minnesota law. So we do have uh, gender expression codified there as well. Um, so I think broadly what, 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 what this aim is, is to ensure that that we are not allowing this this practice, this very narrow practice that has an agenda to change something that that promises to change something specific about a person, uh, in this case their sexual their sexuality or their gender identity, but seeks to affirm what that what what the what the patient's own kind of conclusions and growth to to reach an understanding of what their gender identity their gender expression their sexual their sexuality may be so uh, representative Pearson I hope that that might shed a little bit more light on your question representative Pearson not not really um it because it doesn't go to the very it because it, it is a very um loose term and I don't know if if under the safe schools is it defined uh, the, the term gender expressions, is it defined under the safe schools um, bill? I, it might be used, but I, is it defined anywhere? Oh, Representative Kentrail. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pearson. One moment. I'm hearing it now. So, Madam Chair, Representative Pearson, although it is not defined in the safe school statute, it is also mentioned. So just kind of going back to your point about, um, while it, it doesn't have a solid definition, it is mentioned elsewhere in, in our statutes. And I appreciate that. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Representative Pearson. Um, and, and I appreciate that, and I, I certainly understand that uh, the context is important, right? And I fully get it, but the term is 
I mean, the term gender is still very much so being discussed, debated, and multiple definitions of what people mean just by what they say when they say gender. When we say gender expressions, that could mean how, I, how an individual identifies, or it could mean a physical characteristic. A high-pitched voice for a man may be a gender expression that you're saying a mental health practitioner could not say that they're going to help somebody with, with a predetermined goal. Um, and, and that's how I'm reading this. And again, I'm, I'm just trying to help build the, the statute to be, uh, assuming it's signed into law, it becomes a statute, right? Um, but just trying to, trying to make sure that we're not overreaching and creating um, what Representative Mann had, had talked about, really tying the hands of, of that patient and uh, doctor relationship and not allowing uh, practitioners to do that. Um, you know, I, I also think of, because it also says reduce, sh um, reduce sexual or romantic attractions, uh, feelings towards others, um, eliminate. Oh, you know, that, that's actually all right. I, uh, well, I, I was trying to, trying to make sure we're not out, outlying a nymphomaniac or someone who actually has a, has a mental disorder that we're going to try to, because we're reducing sexual feelings in that situation, and that's, you know, if you're, if you're broadly defining this as, it, as it's written, uh, someone who, is, who, who has that ailment um, that's seeking professional help, and the, the practitioner is saying they can help that person, to me, this, this law is actually forbidding that, and that's just a couple of narrow scope things that, that I'm picking off. So, I, and, and again, maybe that doesn't apply. Uh, the gender expressions, though, is just such a broad term, and, and I, again, feel like under definitions, a little more time should be taken on, on some of these very far-reaching terms. Zenifana. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Kentrell. Um, my question is actually, I think, possibly for uh, Dr. Charmley, if she's still here, or possibly Sue from NAMI. Representative, um, Dr. Margaret Charmley. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Kentrell, Dr. Charmley. So there's been um, a little piece during this discussion that has has been really nagging at me. Um, and, and specifically, you know, we've kind of been talking a little bit about um, sort of the it seems like we're in some ways we're asking about the need for this, right? And and is this absolutely necessary? Do we we need to do this? Do we, from a public safety perspective, from the perspective of uh, protecting our children, do we do we need to do this? Um, and and I guess one of the things that that no one has really brought up that that seems to bother me is we talked a lot about choice and we talked a lot about um, the difference between leading someone down a path and guiding them to their own path. Um, and, and I think the, this law specifically is aimed at adolescents and folks under the age of 18. Um, we had a testifier who was talking about being led to therapy as early as age 10, I believe it was. And, and I don't know about the rest of the folks in this room, but, but at age 10, even at 12, age 15, I think we all, just like a little child, right, we look back at our parents to see how they're going to react because we want that love and acceptance. Um, and and I, I think about that a great deal as we've been talking about choice and whether um, adolescents are able to choose for themselves their course of therapy. And I guess my question is this. Um, you know, in your experience, or as a professional, are children generally in a place where they are, uh, feel, they feel empowered that they could speak up um, and say if a course of therapy is not okay, or are they more likely to go along with something because they feel that it's what 
their parents want and they want that love and acceptance. I guess that's what I, that's keeps nagging at me during this. And I, and I don't think that's been addressed. Dr. Charmerly. So you are asking whether or not a child is able to make an informed decision mm -hmm. about treatment. And I would say most likely not in some cases that it requires some adult discretion and decision making in order to make decisions of that nature. Just like you wouldn't expect a child to make a decision about having brain surgery. That's, we need to have guidance on that. Representative Madam Governor. Chair, thank you. And, and that said, I mean, I guess the, the part that, that second piece of that that's nagging at me is to me, it feels like the definition of convergent therapy has been fairly well outlined, and we understand the difference between um, allowing someone to explore their sexuality through therapy in a healthy way or um, being forced down a specific path. Um, and I guess my, my question is, you know, if, if, if adolescents are not in a place where they could truly advocate for themselves. Number one, it feels to me a little bit like this, this provision is more important than ever. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, in your professional opinion, you know, is it, I don't know how to say this in a good way, is it appropriate or is there some remedy that therapists can employ when they feel that um, a parent is perhaps pushing a child down a path that that they perhaps want that is not healthy or in line with the child's wishes. Dr. Shamley, could you elaborate on your question, please, in terms of what path they're being pushed down? <laughs> please. Great. So I think we talked a little bit about you know being able to explore and and talk about your own sexuality and health way. Obviously, we've discussed that that's good therapeutic practice. Um, but I know, you know, this, this provision specifically talks about um, in advance pushing someone into a therapy where we're talking about changing their gender identity specifically, that we are telling them that something is not okay. We have talked about the fact that telling them that something is a mental defect or that is somehow wrong, which we know is, is according to the law, not okay, right? But if, if, there, if a child is being pushed down a road such as that, um, I'm trying to understand where, um, where a, a therapist could potentially push back on that and say something if they feel like the child is in jeopardy in some way around that. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, one of the resolutions that came out of the task force report of the American Psychological Association on appropriate therapeutic responses to sexual orientation was that of, and I read part of it earlier in my testimony, was that parents, guardians, and so on are advised against seeking therapy that promises to change sexual orientation. What I didn't finish, which was also part of that resolution, was that they are instead sought to seek um, therapy that helps them explore and understand and seek social support and get accurate information about sexual orientation and gender identity. So it, to help a parent to understand what that means, what it is, what some of the pros and cons are uh, in regard to what we know about the scientific research. Thank you. Representative Bonner. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one last question, um, I promise. Um, and that is a little bit, there was a, a, a line of questioning that came up earlier and we were talking a little bit about reporting things when they were not appropriate. And, and we're specifically talking about a group of individuals who are, vulnerable, right? They're um, conflicted, perhaps. Um, and they're looking for um, guidance to go down a path. And I, um, because of that vulnerability, um, you know, we talked a little bit about what if, you know, 
if someone were to report that they were perhaps being led down a path that was not appropriate therapeutically. And I guess my concern is that because they're vulnerable adults, how likely is it that these folks who are maybe seeking that love and affection from family or they're, they're conflicted, that they would be likely to speak up and share if they were being um, abused or led down a path that they may not even realize is um, detrimental that we as adults should be aware of. Dr. Shomerly. So you're asking how likely a person might be to advocate for themselves and to make a statement? You know, I think that depends on the individual. Uh, there are some young people that seem to know that something is wrong and they they report it and they make a scene. Many people don't because they are under the influence of, you know, wanting to be loved, as you say. Um, another parallel experience is how many women report sexual assault. And sometimes they wait years to report it uh, because for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like they may be heard or understood. So people are, there's a variety and, and a variance in terms of what would prompt somebody to say something. Thank you. Um, just that they they may not be in a place to feel safe. I, I appreciate yes. that, and and thank you for your indulgence in this line of questioning. I really appreciate your opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to call for a roll call on this vote. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All right, so hearing none. Um, so the chair renews her motion that House File 12 be recommended for re referral to the Committee on Commerce. The clerk would take the roll. Chair Moran? Uh, yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Yes. Minority Lead Keel? <laughs> Representative Albright? Representative Backer? No. Representative Bonner? Yes. Representative Edelson? Yes. Representative Fisher? Yes. Representative Freiburg? Yes. Representative Liebling? Representative Loeffler? Yes. Representative Mann? Yes. Representative New? No. Representative Pearson? No. Representative Pinto? Yes. Representative Robbins? No. Representative Schumacher? No. Representative Schultz? Yes. Okay, there have been 10 yes and 6 no's. The motion prevails. House File 12 is recommended for re referral to the Committee of Commerce. Um, Um, so I just want to state that uh, our next meeting will be on Tuesday. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're not done yet. Excuse me. Excuse me. We're not completely done. Thank you. Um, I have a few uh, an announcement. Um, our next meeting will, will be on Tuesday, February the 19th uh, at 2.30, room 200 in the State Office Building. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.